Hey, uh, happy Father's Day to all the awesome dads out there and even the not awesome dads out there because we have some of those just in our experiences, right? But I mean, really, it's a tough day. It's a good day. It's a day worth celebrating uh, amazing dads. And I know at the same time, there's a lot of you that, man, you wish, you wish dad would have shown up more. Maybe that's an easy way to, to put it. Um, there's others. That I'm talking to people this morning. I know today's the first uh, Father's Day without dad. And so I know that Father's Day, just like Mother's Day, when we talk about it, it's, it's an amazing, joyous celebration. I'm thankful for the amazing dads in this house. I know many of you guys, and I'm uh, just thrilled to get to serve alongside of you, building God's kingdom right next to you. And so I uh, celebrate you dads today. And then I think we also ought to just spend a moment praying for uh, not just all the dads that are here, but all the dads we miss, um, all the dads we missed growing up. And we just kind of let a moment here for the Holy Spirit to, to press on us however he wants to press on us this morning. So let's pray. Um, Lord, we know that you are the ultimate father and that uh, whether we like it or not, as dads, God, uh, on our best day, we get to be a, a fragmented picture of who you really are. We get to show your beauty and your kindness and your love to our kids and to our families and to our cities and communities. Um, and God, at worst, we can misrepresent you. And so God, I pray that we would take that with a dose of courage today from your Holy Spirit. I pray that, uh, God, would you raise up and continue to raise up uh, ferocious, courageous men of God in this house. Um, and God, we do just ask um, that you would also comfort those who are missing dad this morning, who are maybe mourning the, the, the lack of a dad growing up or, or regretting uh, some of the decisions that have been made by dad. And I just pray that you would help us release those today, that we wouldn't let those uh, projections of our earthly father um, represent you. I pray that we release in the Father's love today, knowing that you are perfect and you are beyond our, uh, beyond really comprehension of how much you care for us and love us in all that you do. Um, God, I pray specifically for the, for the men in this room who wish they were dads and they aren't right now. I can think of several friends, even right now, who haven't gotten the opportunity to welcome a kid into the world. And God, we just pray that um, you have them in this season uh, for however long. Um, and you're doing something in everyone's heart, regardless of if we have kids or not. We're not, our purpose, our value isn't defined by uh, the amount of arrows we have in the quiver. And that's an easy uh, thing to get lost in, in church. Um, we get so excited about kids, but I also pray that you would help, help us see that our purpose in, as men um, is not defined by how many kids we have, God, but it's by who you are and what you've called us. Um, and so God, would we um, be a family that continually faithfully just, just sees and, and, make space for those who are wishing for kids. And God, I just pray miraculously that um, our, our friends, our brothers, our, our sisters who are in this room right now who are deeply wanting to have children of their own and can't, God, would you miraculously make a way where there is no way? Um, we pray that that would come and that would happen um, in, a, in a beautiful way, Lord. We love you and we are grateful for the dads today and all the meat that is being cooked on some grill, on some smoker somewhere in Jesus' name. Amen. Anybody? Anybody just got meat, wet ribs on the grill right now, brisket on the grill right now? Okay. Less than I was expecting, but that's all right. Hopefully you get something good. Dad's in the room. Hopefully this day, it's the one day. It's about you today, dads. I hope you enjoy it. Take it all in. Yeah. Um, like Robin said, we are in this Gospel According to Mark series. And so we are going to jump in. But before we do, um, I just want to tell a quick story about last week and give a shout out to one of our areas of the serve team. Last week, I'm, I'm preaching going along, trying to talk. As I, as I see one of our high school students, um, kind of frantically, I can see him just out these doors. And I know nobody else can see him. You're all oriented towards me, right? And so I see this kid. He, he looks panicked, panic struck. And he's just kind of frenetically running around over here. And there's maybe a couple others that follow him. And then I see him kind of meander this way and he grabs uh, somebody on our security team and he grabs them. And then all of a sudden they all go dashing back this way. So that's a thrilling moment, right? Like for me, I'm just like, trying to have like cohesive thoughts continue to come out of my mouth and I'm not trying to freak out, but I'm like, is there something worth freaking out going on down there, you know? And all, all, all that was happening, uh, we had a uh, kids ministry volunteer who had an incident. Um, he fell, it looked like maybe he was having a stroke. He's fine, he's totally fine. But I am, I'm grateful for our security team that is consistently serving kind of in the background in this room every single week. Yeah. Whether it's, whether it's just engaging with and talking with people who maybe look a little out of place in a warm and welcoming and loving way, or, or whether it's handling incidents like that in a way that this room doesn't get stirred up and brought into the chaos of maybe what's kind of handling, being handled behind the scenes. I, I am super grateful for you. I'm also very grateful uh, for Tammy and Jeff Fisher, um, uh, just for helping organize and set up our security team. 
They have helped make sure every single weekend we walk in here, we have a security team that is staffed. First of all, hello, that's good to have some people in this room who are, who are ready for, uh, to be involved in something. And that, that's, that's no small thing, right? Um, but we also, they're equipped, they are organized, they have all the directions they need. And so just grateful for that team, for all that they have done to build that up. So um, yeah, thank them. If you see a little guy with an earpiece, you know, give him a high five. Don't, don't move too fast, you know, but <laughs> give him a high five, right? It'd be good. So that's a joke, bad joke. All right. Um, we're going to be in uh, the Gospel of Mark. We're going to read through most of chapter four this morning. And so what we've experienced, what we've walked through so far is really uh, the Gospel of Mark through the lens of the kingdom of God. We talked about a couple of weeks that Jesus' main message is, hey, the kingdom is, is right here. The kingdom is at hand. The kingdom of God has arrived. And so it's beginning in this already not yet where there is light breaking through the darkness of this world. Jesus is beginning to, we saw it last week in just sort of his normal everyday business. He's healing people. He's setting people free who are under oppression. And he is, he is bringing salvation and forgiveness to those, who have, to those who have experienced oppression or have been taken captive by the kingdom of darkness. And so Jesus shows us in everyday life what the kingdom of God breaking through everyday normalcy looks like. And as we're invited to follow him, our invitation is to commune with the Father like Jesus communed with the Father, to to make sure we have margin and interruptibility in our schedule so that we can uh, be intentional like Jesus was intentional. Jesus was probably one of the most intentional human beings that's ever walked this planet. He He didn't miss a moment, right? And as we should take after modeling him, what we can do is we can embrace the fact that he saw needs that were in front of him, and he, and he took the time to stop and to sit down and to recline and to be with those people who were, who were most needy for his help. People who had been outcast and cast to the side in the margins of culture. Really, it's, it's kind of an odd uh, first day for this holiday. We have this holiday, Juneteenth. Um, I didn't grow up with this holiday. I wasn't familiar with this holiday. Um, but I think the, the mistake that we could make at this point would be to just kind of cast it out, to demonize, demonize or politicize something that is really significant in our nation's history. Like you think about the moment where freedom was declared over the last person in the United States. That's a big deal. We, we don't need to make this some separate issue. Like today's Juneteenth, so it kind of gets weirdly wrapped in with Father's Day on this first day that it's recognized as a national holiday. But my, my encouragement would be, man, freedom's a big deal, isn't it? Freedom's a big deal. And freedom was brought to this country for some of the people who did not get the luxury of it early on. And that is a day that's worth remembering and celebrating. We don't, we don't need to make it something that it's not. Amen? And so Jesus, what he's bringing consistently is deliverance, forgiveness, healing, and freedom to the people that he's interacting with. And so what we get to this week is a few more parables on the kingdom. And that's how the the heading starts in my Bible, ESV. If you have yours with you, you can open it up. We're gonna be in uh, Mark chapter four, starting in verse one. And what we're gonna read here is a few subsequent stories or parables about the kingdom of God. So it says in Mark chapter four, verse one, again, he, Jesus, began to teach beside the sea. And a very large crowd gathered about him so that he got into a boat and sat in it on the sea. And the whole crowd was beside the sea on the land. It's thought that Jesus had gathered such a large crowd that he had to kind of back up away from it a little bit. And the sea acts as like a natural sound reflector so that he can project and teach all these people who have come around to hear his teaching. And he says to them, um, as, as they're sitting there, he was teaching them many things in parables. And in his teaching, he said to them, listen, Behold, a sower went out to sow, and as he sowed, some seed fell along the path, and the birds came and devoured it. Other seed fell on rocky ground, where it did not have much soil, and immediately it sprang up, since it had no depth of soil. And when the sun rose, it was scorched, and since it had no root, it withered away. Other seed fell among thorns, and the thorns grew up and choked it, and it yielded no grain." And other seeds fell into good soil and produced grain, growing up and increasing and yielding 30-fold, 60-fold, and 100-fold. And he said, he who has ears to hear, let him hear. So a couple things that I just want to point out before we really dive into what this means. Fortunately, this is one of the parables that Jesus actually gives us the meaning for. So we're just going to cheat this morning. And I'm not going to try and interpret the meaning. We're just going to read what Jesus says is the meaning. It's great. It's beautiful. Um, 
A couple things. It's, it's good to remember as we encounter Jesus' parables that we, we remind ourselves what parables really are. Parables are, story that are stories that are told in an earthly way, but they have a heavenly meaning. They're different than like an allegory. You think of allegory, you think of Animal Farm, or you think of the Old Man in the Sea. Um, some of these older books, a lot of C.S. Lewis's writing, uh, The Lion, the Witch, and the Wardrobe, all that series is written in allegory. Allegory has significant kind of meaning and representation sort of under every layer of the story all supports a bigger story that's going on. We, we shouldn't think of parables in this way. It, it's not allegory. It's not fable. It's not a tale. Jesus isn't just making up some story. What he's trying to do is he's trying to get us to grab maybe one or two main things. So we could overanalyze and try to grab and find significance to every detail of the parable. And what does this bird actually represent? Or what does this thing actually mean? And that would be to, to misuse the, the mode of storytelling that Jesus is engaged in. Parables weren't a, a, a new thing that Jesus was creating. It was a common way that rabbis, teachers would teach their students was, was to grab these parables or these things with significant uh, eternal meaning and to bring them down into earthly stories. The other thing to keep in mind as we read this is Jesus is telling a parable about farming. How many of y'all just farmers in the crowd? You just got some of it in your DNA. Just raise your hand. It's, don't, be, don't be ashamed. Yeah, so like one out of 10 maybe in the room, Right? This is a good point, uh, a good space to just point out the Bible is written for you, but it's not necessarily written to you. This is something that I think will help you as you read through the gospel of Mark is that as Mark is capturing what was happening with Jesus in live time, and he's not writing to you as an audience, he's writing to his immediate audience around him. That's helpful because sometimes you read this stuff and you're like, why is Jesus talking about farming? The answer is because, man, there are principles in this story that are good for you to hear, but it's not written to you specifically as an audience member. If Jesus was here in the room today, I, I believe that he would teach in parables using things like TikTok, using things like traffic, using things like your 401k to give examples with. Like Jesus teaches in a way that lands with his audience. The Bible is written to people it's written to people in that immediate time. And if we can understand the context of who it's written to, we can better understand what is written for us out of it. So really this parable, this story, is written in this agrarian culture, this, this culture that its whole economy is built on agriculture. And so as Jesus starts talking about seed that's being scattered, that, that okay, pardon my pun, but I think one dad joke ought to slip into the message today. Like he's going to let that story land on whoever it's going to land on, you know? Like he's, he's telling that story knowing that, that everyone is going to have this understanding of what sowing and reaping, what planting and harvesting meant and looked like in that day and age. So as Jesus goes, he's, he's describing a few different things. Let's, let's keep actually, we're going to, hold on, where am I in my notes? We're going to keep reading in verse 10 because we're going to get into the explanation of what this means. Chapter four, verse 10. And when he was alone, those around him with the 12 asked him about the parables. Take heart, if you don't understand some of Jesus' teaching, neither did the disciples. Right? Uh, Jesus would teach a story, he'd tell a parable, and then the disciples would come around and he'd be like, do you understand? They're like, yeah, yeah, we understand. But what do you mean about all that? That's, that's almost exactly actually how Matthew's version of this story reads, where they're like, oh, we totally understand. And Jesus is like, no, no, you don't but I think he's tapping into our eagerness to try to understand, right? So it says, when he was alone, he starts talking to them about the parables. And he said to them, to you has been given the secret of the kingdom of God, but for those outside, everything is in parables so that they may indeed see, but not perceive. And they may indeed hear, but not understand, lest they should turn and be forgiven. Verse 13, and he, Jesus said to them, do you not understand this parable? How then will you understand all the parables? So let's just pause for a second. This explanation of whatever is going to come out of this parable of the four different kinds of soil is extremely significant. Jesus says, that if you don't get this, you won't get the rest of my parables. This teaching about the kingdom, this teaching about the gospel is critical for you to understand. So he says, if you don't understand this, how will you understand all the parables? And now he starts to explain it for them in verse 14. The sower sows the word. 
The sower sows the word. We, in our context, hear that and we think of the Bible, the word of God, this book. That's not what this word actually means. What Jesus is saying here, when he uses that word, word, he says, uh, the, the word is the good news of the kingdom. So the sower sows the good news, the gospel of Jesus, the good news of the coming of the kingdom into the world. The, the, the message that there is reconciliation with God available. There is peace with God available. There is healing. There is freedom that can be found by this person, by this King, Jesus. That gospel, that message is the word that the sower is sowing. So he says, the sower sows the word. Look at this in 1 Thessalonians 2.13. This is Paul writing. He says, and we also thank God constantly for this, that when you received the word of God, they didn't receive a, a goat skin, leather bound paper Bible. That's not the word that they received. They, they received the gospel, the good news of who Jesus was, which you heard from us and you accepted it, not as the word of men, but as what it really is, the word of God, which is at work in you believers. Romans 1.16. Paul says this, for I am not ashamed of the gospel for it is the power of God for salvation to everyone who believes to the Jew first and also to the Greek. In a lot of other translations, it says, for I am not ashamed of the word. I'm not ashamed of this story. I am not ashamed of the good news. So the sower goes out and he's sharing, he's sowing the good news about who Jesus is and what he's come to do. Verse 15, and these are the ones along the path where the word is sown. When they hear, Satan immediately comes and takes away the word that is sown in them. So this, this farmer, this, this sower is out there just scattering seed. I think of like Taylor used to describe what it was like to, to throw seed onto the green. And he kind of has this little like move that he does. But it's like the farmer is, notice this, the farmer is just generously sowing seed. He, he's not, he's not, I mean, I think we think of like our, how many of you have like a garden bed in your backyard, a raised bed or something like that? Like you don't just go out there and throw seeds at that thing, do you? No, you like carefully plant things or you get starters and you plant the starters. That's not how they would have planted or understood farming now. What they're doing is they're just, they're just throwing it out there. The, the sower is out there just casting seed all over. Some of it is falling on a path. And Jesus says, this represents the people who have heart in their hearts. And what happens is that word doesn't penetrate. The, the seed can't take root in them because they've hardened their heart, because um, they, have, they have gotten bitter, they've gotten disenfranchised with the gospel, they've heard it maybe before, and they've just consistently said no to the working and the grace of the Holy Spirit. And as a result, their heart has gotten hard. And that seed, that gospel that you share, it doesn't sink in, it doesn't penetrate, it can't yield anything because as it bounces off of them, Satan comes and he just keeps snatching it away, snatching it away. So we keep reading. And it says, these are the words, uh, take away the word that is sown on them. Satan takes away the word that is sown on them. 16, and these are the ones sown on rocky ground. The ones who, when they heard the word, immediately received it with joy and they have no root in themselves, but endure for a while. Then when tribulation and persecution arises on account of the word, immediately they fall away. This, I think this is best described as the person who, who wants all the benefits of Christianity and, and they come into a church and they see, man, there's, there's great community here. There, there's worship, people are engaged. There's something that is happening, something stirring up. I want this freedom. I want this salvation. And they see all the benefits of what Jesus brings and they haven't counted the costs of following him. So they, they immediately receive the gospel of joy. They're like, are you kidding me? There's all that that's available to me. I can have freedom. I can have healing. I can have blessing and prosperity. And I can have these different things that come with the gospel but they haven't counted the cost of what following Christ really looks like. That even though there may be persecution, even though there may be famine, even though there may be trial and tribulation, our call, our, our refining of our faith happens in those spaces, not in the spaces where things are awesome, amen? amen? But it's in the midst of the diagnosis, it's in the midst of the separation, in the midst of the money going who knows where. Those are the times when we as believers get to really have our faith refined and we get to see, okay, I, I wasn't coming to Jesus for his gifts only. I was coming to him for him because he's Lord and Savior and you can't have one without the other. He's both. 
And so this people who have rocky soil, if you think about how, how gardening and how plants work, it's when the, the, it's when the soil gets hot that a seed germinates. And so because there's rockiness in the soil, it's causing the soil to heat up quickly and that seed is sprouting right away. But it grows up and it doesn't take root. The taking root is what happens when you allow the gospel to continue to work through the difficult and hardest seasons of your life. And as that happens, man, those roots of your faith continue to permeate down deeply. The third kind of soil, others who are sown among thorns. They are those who hear the word but the cares of the world and the deceitfulness of riches and the desires for other things enter in and choke out the word and it proves unfruitful. I mean, this is, this is where I think apathy and complacency and just a love and a drift for the world that is in every single American. You can't convince me otherwise. It's just so easy to give yourself over to the God of money, to give yourself over to the promises of comfort, things that we so highly value in this country. And, and Jesus makes it clear, you cannot serve both masters. You cannot serve both God and money for you will love one, you'll worship one and you will despise the other. And so when push comes to shove, when push comes to shove, Jesus is Lord of all of it. And we know these people, right? Who maybe they grew up in church. Maybe they grew up around church. They grew up around Christian people. And man, it seemed like for a long time, there was a fruitfulness that could be coming out of their life, but they just slowly kind of drifted off and have given themselves over to the cares and the comforts and the concerns of this world. Rather than continuing to, as one commentator put it that I read this week, gardening their soul, tending to the soil of their soul making sure that, man, that, that's why I tithe. That's why I give. That's why I pray. That's why I show up to church with the first hour of my week. Because what I'm doing every time is I'm tending the garden of my soul to make sure that all these other rhythms and routines and things that I can so easily fall in love with, if I'm not careful, those are just consistently uh, groomed out of my heart. Amen? Amen. Y'all quiet this morning, but it's okay. We're not stopping. Um, I could, we'll just pause here because the next soil is the spectacular soil. But let's just acknowledge that I think what Jesus is trying to do is he's trying to encourage his disciples in this moment that a lot of times you're going to be sowing seed and it isn't going to look spectacular. Three of the four soils, in fact, I would say are, are frustrating, aren't they? Some gets snatched right away, it's gone. It doesn't take root. Some of it, it looks good right away. And, and we can all think of that believer where it's like, man, they came to church and they were just so excited and they were here for like one minute, Right? It's like, where are they now? It's like, man, they're gone off the deep end, somewhere crazy. And there are, there are three kinds of soils that are frustrating and don't yield fruitfulness, but it doesn't stop the sower from sowing generously. So the sower in the gospel of Matthew, it, we see that it's Jesus primarily. Jesus is the one sowing the seed. Now, as we look back and we reflect on this parable, we know that it is our privilege to get to carry the gospel. It's our privilege to get to carry the good news of Jesus. And the reminder that I want for all of us is, man, we sow the seed of the gospel. We spread the story of what Jesus has done liberally. Like we spread it out all over the place. We cast that seed as far as we can. I, I have one friend who's sitting in this room who, who just says, hey, it's just shots on goal, right? I don't know if it's the hard heart that I'm dealing with. I don't know if it's the rocky soil or the good soil. And so I'm just, my, my role is going to be just to spread the seed. Why send the kids to Desperation Conference? Why make sure your neighbor kid gets here for Go Big? Because we're just going to keep on throwing seed out there. Maybe not all of it's going to stick right now. Maybe, maybe some of it's going to get caught up in some weeds, but my job, our role as the church is to consistently share the good news. Jesus has come. Freedom is here. Salvation is available right now. You can be reconciled to God. This message needs to keep on getting out of us in any way that we can find it. And so whether that's, whether that's the way that you sow into this place financially and we get to continue to take the gospel to the ends of the earth or to Grand Junction where Glenn Brown is, right? All of that is us participating in that seed going out. The other thing that I take notice of is, is we don't try to alter the contents of the seed to make it more palatable for the soil. So we don't, we don't, try, to, we don't try to superficially, uh, you know, I, I, was, I was listening to one pastor and I think he went over the deep end a little bit. He's like, we don't, we don't try to like dress up the guy sowing the seed to make sure he looks as cool as possible to make sure he can create as much of a harvest as possible. I'm kind of making fun of pastors dressing up or looking a certain way or having this celebrity mentality. And I agree with that. Man, it's, it's not about the person throwing the seed out even. 
We, and we shouldn't try to dress up or alter the seed. If, if we get off of the word of God, if we get off of the gospel and we start offering something else, man, it might be fruitful, amen? It might yield something, might grow something, but it's not gonna be the fruit of the spirit. So it might look really good. It might be some really good moralism that we're getting out of our kids. They might, it might be really good behavior, but it's, if it's not gospel-centered transformation, if it's not the actual seed of the good news of Jesus, and we're trying to sugarcoat it and cover it, offering just the benefits of Jesus without the cost of following Jesus. If we're just looking at uh, everything that, that God the Father has done, but we don't invite the Holy Spirit, there's all these different things. We don't try to doctor the seed. What we do is we pray to the soil. Because if, did you notice in this story also that it's not our job to make sure there's a harvest? It's not our job to make sure there's a harvest. I'll kind of unpack that over these next few points. There's, there's three subsequent parables that Jesus teaches out of this primary one. So again, you have these four kinds of soil and we talked about the, the path and we talked about the rocks and we talked about the, the weeds that are in there. But the fourth soil, this is, this is classic Jesus for a parable. He lands with this kind of wow, shock factor statement. He says, but those who were sown on the good soil are the ones who hear the word and accept it and bear fruit 30 fold and 60 fold and a hundred fold. Now I'm no farmer. I'm a pastor, but I have heard that if you want to be a better pastor, then you should try some farming or try some gardening. Maybe I'll give that a try at some point. I, I tried to research what a, what, a, what a good crop yield would be. Somewhere around tenfold would be considered excellent. So Jesus just, because we just hear 30 fold and you're just, I'm just like, I don't know. I mean, you, you throw one grain of wheat in the ground, it grows up to a little stalk and it has like 30 grains of wheat. On, I don't even know. I don't even know how many little grains of wheat are on the top of a wheat stalk, you know? I'm not a farmer. I'm not a gardener. I don't know what's going on. But so what is it? Jesus, Jesus has this shock factor that, man, some of the seed that you plant in the kingdom of God, when you see it in the kingdom, it's going to yield 30 fold, 60 fold, 100 fold that which was planted. It just makes me think of like how this message of the gospel, when we get to the book of Acts and there's just a, a few hundred believers maybe at that time. And now how Christianity is this unstoppable gates of hell cannot stand against the church. That is a global movement, billions of people who are following after giving their life to King Jesus. I don't, I don't know that they would have said that's what was coming early on, right? But man, now we get a couple thousand years removed from it and this thing just keeps growing, keeps expanding, keeps going out in every single direction. So the three subsequent parables that Jesus goes into are the lamp under a basket, the parable of the seed growing, and the parable of the mustard seed. The lamp under the basket, verse 21, he says, And Jesus said to them, Is a lamp brought in to be put under a basket or under a bed and not on a stand? For nothing is hidden except to be made manifest, nor is anything secret except to come to light. If anyone has ears to hear, let him hear. And he said to them, pay attention to what you hear. With the measure you use, it will be measured to you and still more will be added to you. And for, for to the one who has, more will be given. And, for, and from the one who has not, even what he has will be taken away. So, I mean, what Jesus is talking about, again, we, we can try to get lost in all the little details. What's the lamp? What's the basket? The main point here is stewardship. If you've heard the gospel, if you've received the gospel, if Jesus has done something for you, the, the call that Jesus has on every one of our life is to steward that, to not take that good news, not take that light that has burst forth in us and then hide it out and put it under a lampstand. But no, we set that thing out for wherever someone can see it. Not everyone is going to have a stage to proclaim Jesus's name on, but you do have a platform somewhere to share about the good news of Jesus. You have kids in your house. You have coworkers at your job. You have uh, older retired people in your neighborhood. You could go for a walk and you could meet them. There is no person in this room who does not have a platform or a stand to put the good news of Jesus on for you to share it with somebody. Every single person is called to witness with the measure with which God has already revealed himself to you. I love that because it doesn't, mean, it doesn't mean that I have to have it all figured out before I go and start telling about Jesus. The measure in which God has entrusted the gospel to me, as much as I go, man, God changed that about me. All I'm really obligated to then go out and share is, hey, God changed this about me. Well, what is your view on the eschatology? You know, the, the, are you pre-mill, a-mill, uh, post-trib? You know, and you're just like, you're just like, what? Jesus saved me. I don't know what you're talking about right now. I, I can't even spell eschatology. But I used, I used to get stuck in this and he set me free. 
right? So the obligation that we have is just to share according to the measure with which we've been given. It's stewardship. It's stewardship. You just share what Jesus has shown you already. Press in, study him more. I will never tell you to stop studying. Keep learning those big words. Keep learning about theology. It is not a bad word. But in the meantime, don't, don't wait to share until you've arrived. I don't even know what arrived is going to look like or whatever. It's just going to be at the gates of heaven. It's going to be amazing. And that'll be that. Anyways, <laughs> the next parable, we have the parable of the seed growing. And Jesus said to them, the kingdom of God is as if a man should scatter seed on the ground. He sleeps and rises night and day and the seed sprouts and grows. He knows not how. The earth produces by itself, first the blade, then the ear, then the full grain in the ear. But when the grain is ripe, at once he puts in the sickle because the harvest has come. There is no secret combination of words that you can share to make somebody a Christian. That would make us like repeating an incantation. And that's not what we believe. We believe that our job, our role as Christians is to share the gospel, to throw the seed. And we pray that God would not just blindly convert people, but that he would change the soil of their heart. So look at this verse in Ezekiel, in Ezekiel, because I hope this just encourages some of you who have been witnessing to people for a long time. And you're just like, man, that heart is just stone cold and there's nothing that's ever going to happen. I would agree with you if it wasn't for this prophetic word shared by Ezekiel. He says that I will give you a new heart and a new spirit I will put within you. I will remove the heart of stone from your flesh and give you a heart of flesh. What's he saying? Even the impossible to save people are possible to save because of Jesus. Amen. Even the most hard, bitter, angry, frustrated people on this planet can still experience salvation because God takes dead, stone cold hearts and he makes them alive again because of Christ. So let's just do this real quick. How many of you in the room, you have a person in your life that you could point to right now that is following after Jesus and you would just say, man, at some point in my life, I said to myself, never them, never them. Anybody, raise your hand. Come on, don't be afraid. What are we embarrassed right now? I'm talking about sharing seeds, spreading seeds. Raise it high. Look around. Look around. How encouraging is this? These are people who are raising, we're raising our hand right now because we looked at a person and we said, man, God can save anybody, sure, but never them. It's just not gonna happen for them. And just see all the hands in the room. Don't stop spreading the gospel. Don't quit sharing the good news of who Jesus is. How we pray then becomes critical. We pray not that they would just understand what I'm saying, but that the Holy Spirit would supernaturally change the soil of their heart. We pray that for the lukewarm, that they would get the, get the stones and the rocks out of the way so that the, this thing would be able to take root and grow in them. We pray that for the people who are bitter, who are, who are frustrated at religion. And we ask that God supernaturally, would your Holy Spirit flip that soil upside down? Would you change what's happening? Would you till the ground of these people's hearts? And that's how we pray as we continue to share. Don't give up. I felt like that was something that God put on my heart this morning. Some of you have prodigals. You're waiting and waiting and waiting. And it feels impossible that they would ever come home. Don't stop sharing the good news of who Jesus is. And keep praying that he would take their heart of stone and replace it with a heart of flesh so they might receive. Because here's what can happen. The last parable. Jesus said to them, with what can we compare the kingdom of God? Or what parable shall we use for it? It's like a grain of mustard seed, which when sown on the ground is the smallest of all the seeds on the earth. Now, now some of you might put on your like agriculture, you know, glasses, you might, excuse me. It's actually, I think it's like a black orchid or something like that is one of the smallest seeds. Again, we're talking about an agrarian culture here who would have known that, that the mustard seed was the smallest available seed for, for a crop that you would plant expecting a harvest. So they, he says, there's not a mistake in the Bible. Just as talking, Jesus is talking using a parable that they can understand. He said the mustard seed is this dinky little seed. And yet when it is sown, it grows up. It becomes larger than all the garden plants and puts out large branches, branches so that the birds of the air can make nests in its shade. Don't despise small bits of transformation over a long period of time. Our role is to share the seed. Our role is to share the good news. Some of you are going to share that good news all of your life with people that you love and you're never going to see the growth. But don't give up. Don't give up hope. Keep planting seed. Keep throwing it in there. Dad's in the room. Father's Day, right? What an amazing privilege that we have to pray that the Holy Spirit would help us cultivate soil that is ripe to take the gospel. But it is not up to us. 
Our kids ultimately have to choose that for themselves. We have to choose that for ourselves. And what happens though, as we just consistently share the good news, you, you might think in a moment that you just grabbing your daughter by the little face and just saying, baby, I love you. I love you. You look beautiful today. You might think that is small and insignificant, but if it is planting a kingdom seed in that person, you will never regret that, that moment. You might have one small, seemingly insignificant conversation with a coworker and you're like, well, where did that go? Who knows? Your job was just to bury the seed. Just plant the seed. Just put something in there. Just remind people of who Jesus is. And maybe one day you're, you're going to see that person. Um, like it might, might look like this mustard seed where they become a pastor and they have people that follow after Jesus because of this person. And that person has disciples that come after them. Maybe it's that profound. Maybe it's not. Maybe it's the salvation of one person. Maybe it's healing for one person. But isn't that a mustard seed worth celebrating? That's a harvest. It's fruit. Our job, our role as the people of God is to not take responsibility for what is grown. Our job is to plant the seed. The kingdom of God is based on us who have received the gospel going forward and sharing that good news with whomever we encounter, available in any moment, whether it's our kids, our coworkers, or anyone. And we don't get impatient. Gosh, gardening is a patient process, isn't it? I remember planting tomatoes last year. They did not make it through the summer. Full disclosure. That's me just not gardening well. <laughs> remember the day we planted those tomatoes and, and my youngest, she's just, she loves tomatoes. Favorite thing on plant. She would eat them nonstop if we didn't, you know, it always feels so weird. It's like, stop eating your tomatoes and eat your mac and cheese. And you're like, what am I, what am I saying right now? <laughs> but we planted that thing and she was so eager, right? She was so eager to like have a tomato. And, you know, I remember her going back out the next day for like the next three weeks being like, where are the tomatoes? <laughs> Dad, where are the tomatoes at? I want some tomatoes. And I'm like, babe, those, we're not going to have tomatoes maybe ever, especially if Dad doesn't water and it dies in the middle of the summer. <laughs> it takes time. Be patient. Don't give up hope. Keep sharing the gospel. Keep praying that God would supernaturally do what he does with soil. Amen? Jesus. Amen. Would you guys stand? We're going to pray. Lord, we love you. God, and we are, we are grateful to be people, for the most part, standing in this room who have received your word. We've received the gospel. Help us be people who, who bear fruit, who as we abide with you and spend time just nurturing um, the contents of our own heart, God, would we, would we be more loving and patient and full, filled with self-control and kindness, goodness? God, would you, just, would you just continue to create those things in us? And as a church, God, I pray that even as we're getting ready to walk out the door here now and, and probably go celebrate with dad or miss dad or anywhere in between, we're gonna have a great day. I pray that we would keep in mind today, would we take heart that we've been entrusted with the good news of the kingdom and we can plant seeds anywhere we go. It doesn't take a degree. It doesn't take a microphone. It just takes a willing heart to say, Jesus, this is what you've done. Help me share that with the world around me. We love you, Jesus. And it's in your name we pray. Amen. Amen.